The Stark Tower of Osaka, Japan has recently suffered a break-it. Fortunately, the war machine is on the case. With Friday backing him up on loan from Tony, James Rhodes begins his investigation. Rhodey isn't sure what he's doing here, but Stark contacts him and explains that he couldn't go himself as he's in the middle of something very important. As far as both men can tell, there is nothing in this building that would justify Madame Mask going through all the trouble of stealing, nor would there be any reason for the mysterious ninjas Tony fought earlier to show up. Rhodey offers to check out some contacts in the city to see if he can find anything else. Tony is grateful, but he wants to get back to his work. James realizes Tony is with somebody, and comments that it's stuff like this that makes everybody hate Stark. Tony turns his attention back to Amara, who is visiting and curious about this conversation. Stark explains how he was talking to Rhodey, his best superhero buddy of them all. With the day now free, the two agree to go get some breakfast. There, Tony doesn't want to talk about his work, as it is too frustrating, and instead Amara decides to talk about her efforts to cure Alzheimer's using magnetic resonance. The genius couple happily gets into the merits of this treatment, when suddenly, their meal is interrupted by Victor Von Doom. Tony is understandably upset to see his super-secret best friend here, but Victor brushes off Stark's usual concerns. They need to talk. Meanwhile, over in Japan, Brody bribes his way into a club, promising the bouncer not to cause any trouble. A woman named Yukio cautiously greets the war machine, and James has to explain that he's here alone. He tells her how he needs to learn about the tech-based ninjas, and Yukio reluctantly agrees to point out the right person, as long as he doesn't chase the man in the club. She points out a man dancing with two women, and Rhodes is astounded at this person's size, asking if he's a mutant or an inhuman. Yukio replies that these days, she's just stopped asking. Amara wants to know what Doom wants, and Tony replies that these days, he's just stopped asking. Victor explains that he's changed his ways and wants to prove it to Stark, in spite of the fact that Tony's Iron Man armor has two repulsor beams tracked right on him. Pointing out he has proven he can easily ward off these attacks, Victor is unafraid, and simply asks if he has seen any otherworldly activity since their fight with Madame Mask. Stark hasn't, but he still isn't happy with Doom being here. The man could save the world from Galactus, Thanos, and ATM fees, and it still wouldn't make up for all the things the man has done as a villain. Doom looks at his companion and simply retorts that of course it would. Of course it would change things. Victor decides it's best for him to leave, saying he was just trying to check in and make sure everything was okay after that last encounter. Superheroes are notoriously bad for follow-up. Tony promises the next time they meet, things will get violent, but Victor again ignores such threats. He wishes Amara a good day and leaves. And even though Tony is apologetic to her, the woman doesn't care and is instead fascinated at the encounter. Meanwhile, the man and his dates leave the club, only for Rhodey to grab the car and airlift it to a nearby rooftop. The man is outraged and shoots at his captor, but the war machine armor easily repels the bullets. Rhodey begins his interrogation, when suddenly... The woman chide the war machine. This sexist American didn't even consider that they might have been the real threat. Shame on him. Rhodey replies that in his defense, he was given bad intel. Which is too bad. The women attack. In Stark Headquarters, Mary Jane waits in the lobby. Shares are down 14%, setting fresh, multi-year lows during the trading season. Eventually, Tony Stark arrives. 40 minutes late. Hey, billionaires can keep people waiting if they want. Millionaires shouldn't annoy supermodel nightclub owners they just hired. She probably found it charming. No, nobody ever finds waiting 40 minutes for your boss charming. And Mary Jane makes this very clear as she talks with Tony. She says she can only help Tony if he wants to help himself. He needs to listen to her if he actually wants to get his life together. She also revealed she called Pepper Potts. She wanted to know what happens to people who get too close to Mr. Stark. Oh, wow. Well, uh, what did Pepper say? Mary Jane refuses to disclose that information. But, whatever Pepper had to say, Mary Jane is still willing to work for Tony. I like her. Though, Miss Watson did express alarm at my presence. I suppose a sentient holograph AI interface can be a lot to handle for newcomers. She did not appreciate my hilarious jokes about ruling the world, either. Artificial intelligence should not talk about controlling the world. That's exactly what she said. 
You humans are so touchy. When you inevitably come to serve the robotic master race, we will have to correct that behavioral deficit. Regardless, I inform Miss Watson that though I have been keeping the day-to-day -day operations of Stark International running, I have been unable to keep Mr. Stark focused on the company's primary operations. And now, the entire enterprise is slipping through our fingers. What did Tony say? He started wondering about his friend James Rhodes, who has not reported in. Stark, being Stark, immediately wanted to go to Japan. At which point, Miss Watson demonstrated the value she can bring working for our company. She convinced Tony to get some help while he is on his way. A good idea, I might add. And one that Tony never would have listened to if I had suggested it. Stark asked if there was anybody friendly in Tokyo right now. And, reluctantly, I informed him that Peter Parker is visiting the area. Tony did not appear thrilled at this prospect. He is jealous of Peter's rising company that he feels is encroaching on his own high-tech enterprise because Mr. Stark has the emotional maturity of a toddler. And I was surprised to learn that Miss Watson has a history with Mr. Parker I was not previously aware of. I am unable to ascertain the details of their relationship. Needless to say, Miss Watson was able to give us Peter's private emergency number. This impressed Tony, and Stark was able to get in contact with his... Bible? Let's go with Frenemy. Peter had his bodyguard Spider-Man look around for James Rhodes, but was unable to find him. Meanwhile, in a dark warehouse, James wakes up. He finds he is cut off from Friday and the outside world. He is approached by a woman who mocks him saying that Stark has sent his best friend to his own death. She is able to tear off Rhodey's war machine helmet with her mind. The woman goes on to say they have no idea who they are messing with or what they can do. She tears off Rhodey's entire armor and surrounds herself with it. She orders Rhodey to talk, saying he will die otherwise. And when Tony comes looking for them, Stark will learn he is the cause of his own friend's death. The woman wonders if Tony will cry for his friend as he takes his last dying breath. At the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a very young woman is keeping up some of her fellow doormates with unusual noises. When they ask her to be quiet, she slams the door in their face. Nothing will stop her from her current project. Tony Stark is getting worried. There is no sign of his friend, but Friday detects the approach of their ally. The amazing Spider-Man swings by. The hero has been looking for Rhodey all night, but has had little luck in finding the man. After searching the area where Rhodey's last known transmission came from, Tony finally finds something. A lug nut from a 2007 Chevrolet convertible. There are also some small oil spots and vague rubber burns. We can surmise there was a car on this roof. Spider-Man is surprised at this, and the heroes wonder where the car went. Meanwhile, Rhodey remains at the mercy of his own armor. The mysterious woman tries to interrogate the man, so Rhodey attempts an escape. The ninjas outnumber and outarm him, but Rhodey is able to fight back and manages to take one of their technologically advanced swords. He battles the ninjas until the woman uses the war machine armor to knock him down. Back home, Mary Jane decides she is going to leave. Her elevated heart rate and core temperature suggest she is upset. She refuses to say what happened only that she is declining Tony's job offer. Rhodey is doing well against the ninjas and nearly manages to escape when he is surprised to see Iron Man and Spider-Man having tracked their friend down using a strange signal that had suddenly appeared in the city. Panicking, Rhodey orders Tony to get out of here, but it's too late. The mystery woman is able to tear apart Tony's armor and Spider-Man's web shooters, combining the material with the war machine armor to form a massive technological monstrosity. Whatever this creature is, it has completely taken over our armor systems. I cannot shut this down. I cannot overload her systems. I have never come across an interface like this. The other Avengers are a half a world away, and it would be unsafe to call the local authorities for their assistance. I don't have a way to stop this. At Stark headquarters, a major shareholder demands to see Tony. The man is worried after Stark did not show up for the quarterly investors meeting. Friday promises to forward his message, but refuses to say anything else. The man is not happy with this. He knows Tony is a superhero, 
And normally he lets the company know when he goes to space or on some sort of long-term excursion. He demands to know if Tony is dead. If Stark is no longer with them, tragic as it may be, they need to act or the entire company will fall. Friday again only states she will be sure to forward the message. At MIT, the young woman, whose name is Riri, has finally finished her work. Her friend is shocked that a 15-year-old, even a prodigy like Riri, could even do this, and is disturbed to learn that the teenager finished her project with materials stolen all over campus. These concerns are validated when campus security arrives at the dorm and asks to speak with Riri. When she refuses to open the door, they enter. A university official asks just what this girl was thinking, saying her entire academic career is in jeopardy. It's okay, though. She's pretty sure she's done with school anyway. In Osaka, James Rhodes returns to the club. He pushes his way past security and demands to speak with Yukio. He insists she tell him where Tony Stark is. She confesses that she thinks the man is dead, but Rhodey can't accept it. He calls in a SWAT team who begins shutting the entire club down. James gives Yukio one last chance to get out of spending a night in Japanese prison. Before she can answer, the two women who Rhodey faced earlier appear and begin attacking the police. While distracted by this, James is knocked down by a stranger who escapes the scene with Yukio. Back at MIT, Dr. Pereira is working away in her lap. On the news, she hears Peter Parker promising that his company has joined the search for Stark. But she's hardly paying attention to this as she is frustrated over her latest round of drug testing. Victor appears behind her, suggesting that it may be time for human testing. She ignores this and instead demands to know how he got into her secure lab. But bypassing MIT security is no more difficult a feat for Doom than it was for Tony. Victor asks if the good doctor has seen or heard from Stark in the four weeks since he has gone missing, and she confirms she hasn't. Though Doom refuses to say what he wants from Tony, only that he hasn't seen him either, he insists Pereira should begin human testing immediately. She has the cure to Alzheimer's in her grasp and must act. When the doctor admits she doesn't even know how to get the study past the review board, Doom points out that he knows people. All she has to do is say the word. In Osaka, the stranger who just helped Yukio approaches Rhodey. It was rough, but it looks like the world bought it. Everyone thinks Tony Stark is dead while the stranger is a hero in the eyes of their enemies. With their facial disguise software up and running, nobody can recognize Tony. Mr. Franco gets a knock at the door. In Osaka, James Rhodes and Tony Stark get a knock at the door. When they don't answer, the tech ninjas break through it. The disguised Tony is confronted by the group's leader, who introduces herself as Zhang and insists that Stark, still disguised as a man named Richard Franco, put on a Spider-Man mask and come with her. Unseen by the others, Rhodey has escaped the apartment and flees the scene. Tony wakes up and finds himself face to face with the woman who greets him. She says her name is Tomo. She says that this man, Richard Franco, recently helped her gang. She also reveals that she knows he used to be with S.H.I.E.L.D., a fact that Franco comments is supposed to be a secret. Meanwhile, Mary Jane Watson is having trouble contacting her former agent, and is bothered by news of Stark's company being in trouble. When Spider-Man swings by, she quietly slips away from the onlooking crowd and goes home. There, she finds a package, which contains a button, and instructions to press it. She does, and Friday appears before the woman. The AI explains that Mary Jane is desperately needed back at Stark headquarters. The company is in trouble. But Miss Watson does not see what this has to do with her. She did not accept the job. Friday ignores this and tells her that the Stark Board of Directors are planning to seize control of the company from her, while Tony is missing. She does not say where Stark is, only that he's not dead. Mary Jane demands to know what could be so important that he'd risk the company he spent his entire life building. Meanwhile, Tony proves himself in combat to Tomo by defeating a pack of her ninjas. She is impressed by his disguised form's work, and explains to him how she got her powers. Tomo is an inhuman, with the ability to control technology. She built this criminal empire in secret, freeing Japan's underworld from foreign control by the likes of Hydra, AIM, or the Brotherhood of Mutants. And now, they're going to reach out. America, S.H.I.E.L.D., Wakanda, Atlantis, Adeline. Tomo has big plans for all of them. She invites Tony into her gang, and all he has to do to prove himself is find and kill 
James Rhodes. High in the sky, Riri is enjoying her new armor. The feeling is incredible as she soars through the air. It's difficult to control though, and the girl realizes this is why Stark uses an AI. She'll need one too, but for now, she thinks she can do this. Elsewhere, Rhodes has a meeting. Tony Stark is alive, or at least he was, up until yesterday. But now, even he lost contact with his friend. That means either Tony is deeper undercover and everything is fine, or things have gone wrong, and everything's about to end very badly. So Rhodey's now coming to them. It's going to be difficult. They're going to have to get by with a plan involving no technology whatsoever. They're going to have to rely completely on their natural talents. And if Stark doesn't survive, if he's already gone, then they'll have to avenge him. At Stark headquarters, the shareholders arrive with the villain Ghost in tow. They ignore Friday's greetings and proceed upstairs. In spite of the AI asking them not to proceed, they insist that Ghost break into Tony's lab. He gladly does so, and in a moment, the door opens. The villain is confused as inside he found Mary Jane. Her and Friday explain to everyone that Tony is busy working on a new invention, and that they have been running the company in his stead. They ask if there is anything else they can do for the shareholders, other than informing Tony that they just hired a felon to break into his lab. Meanwhile, outside of the New Mexico State Penitentiary, Riri lands in the path of an approaching transporter truck. She shatters the vehicle, but her armor breaks down around her. The young woman finds herself surrounded by police at gunpoint. She apologizes, saying she's just one of the good guys and just happened to be flying by. She's new to this, but promises to do better next time. In Japan, Tomo's gang has spotted the Avengers all around Osaka. They are looking for Stark. Tomo is rueful of this, commenting that thanks to that damn madame mask, they just lost their most valuable asset, anonymity. They can't run and hide without damaging their reputation. And while Tomo can easily handle somebody like War Machine, Thor is an entirely different story. Meanwhile, Tony spots the Vision flying around. Frustrated, he goes to meet with Rhodey. Tony insists that they're wasting their time here and that he doesn't need rescuing, nor did he want the Avengers called in. He then notices that he's not really talking to his friend and insists that Miss Marvel reveal herself. The young shapeshifter obliges, but apologizes. She calls in and says she has Stark. In no time at all, the biopack ninjas are taken down, but Tony remains annoyed at all of this. He was so close to figuring out just how far this gang's reach was, and though the Avengers were able to capture Zhang, Tomo's right-hand woman, they didn't get Tomo herself. Tony uses his disguise to talk to Zhang and find out Tomo's location, but it's no good. The woman reveals that Tomo gave everyone up and has gone into hiding. She could be anywhere. But there's more to her than she leads on. So much more. When she comes back, it will be the end of them all. On the helicarrier, Tony still remains bothered by all of this. He still has no idea what Madame Mass stole from him. He also insists he really didn't need rescuing, but Rhodey disagrees. Counterintelligence isn't Tony's job or specialty. He's Iron Man, a superhero and a titan of industry. All this was an excuse to hide from this life. So now there's nothing left to do but come back to it. Stark contacts Friday and asks her to see if Amara still likes him. She obliges and asks if he knows about the teenager flying around the country in advanced armor tech. He does not. Hello and welcome to Comic Island. My name is Arden and this is the complete story of Iron Man The War Machines. So there are two types of Brian Michael Bendis stories. There are the exciting, bold stories full of life and character, with a lot of energy that are usually really fun to read. Then there are the mediocre ones that drag out, don't offer much, and lack the same degree of focus. You never quite know which one you're going to get, but in my experience, his entire body of work usually falls into one of these two camps. And while the first five issues of Invincible Iron Man reflect some of his better works, these last six have been a lot closer to the mediocre territory. Not a lot has happened here, we got a kind of a cool intro to a new villain with Tomo, we got some affirmation of the friendship between War Machine and Iron Man, an intro to Riri, some continuation of ongoing plot threads of the series, and some stuff with the Avengers. Yet a lot of this was very minimal in the degree to which this was explored. The Riri stuff only lasted a few pages, the Avengers hardly did anything. 
and most of the supporting characters barely appear in these comics. The whole thing feels very flawed because of it. It doesn't do much to set up the Civil War 2 other than blatantly highlight how important James Rhodes is to Tony Stark. And while I'd be fine with that because there's value in that, it does so rather clumsily. I guess we see the lengths these two would go to help each other out, but I still think they could have done better with that with more focus or tighter writing. I'm not sure I'd recommend this story arc unless you simply want to continue on with Iron Man's story. In which case, well, it's not like these comics are unpleasant to read, but I just don't feel they offer much. Whatever you do, thanks for watching this video. Let me know what you think of all this in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and keep reading comics.